Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen of the Kaggle Show. My name is Don Agent. I'll be your host for today's episode. And welcome back, my buddy Steve Cross, for another episode of Back in the Day. Hey, it's like we never left. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, it's it's always, always difficult to pull you off the phones because I know how much uh, how much uh, time you spent on there helping our customers around the globe. But thanks again for taking some time out and kind of pick up a little bit where we left off on the last show. Um, you know, we were talking about uh, lane ma maintenance procedures, both past and present. Correct. You know, you were touching base on, on spray gun technology and then when lane machines kind of got involved. And actually, what was interesting is you pulled a document out that I got right here. Which, right. Uh, you showed me from, from Golden Pen Lanes in Tucson, and this was the actual procedure you'd follow with a spray gun where it told you how many pumps from how many feet to what, and can you kind of explain to the audience what that was when you got on site? Sure. Uh, this is, uh, you know, during our procedure week, uh, uh, our head man, Len Nicholson, would go uh, Thursday to Thursday, and he'd go and do a pre-tournament prior to me finishing up the uh, prior tournament. And this would be like envelope please uh, that on the next tournament and I would get this in an envelope. And this was the procedure we started out with and it's strictly spray guns. And if he's got a close up of this, it's merely the amount of pumps in this gun right here that we apply between, uh, uh, for instance, FL is foul line to eight feet with this X amount of pumps. And it would sort of look like so if, if We've got it in here, and basically we were creating a, like a Christmas tree pattern, wider in the front and tapering out uh, down the lanes, and then uh, taking that with an applicator and and uh, uh, bumping it down to uh, an X amount of foot towards the head pin. And literally, unlike today, when you know, for some people in our audience, it may not know, with modern day lane machines, I mean, you get a piece of paper, an electronic file, but it, it is not a handwritten type of thing. Like no, it's that. not. I no. Mean, it shows you a nice, you know, 2D graph, 3D graph. So you mm -hmm. literally walked in the vault and got a paper. This was your oil pattern. That, that is was correct. your information yeah. and your procedures. That's fantastic. I wanted to read something out of, uh, for the audience on Rule 11 lane maintenance. Yes, this is what we're, uh, this was our bylaw, what we had to go by. Yes. One of the things that, that John, you know, would always talk about, and I know you and I and, and Lenny and a lot of us had these conversations, but the PBA's goal is to provide the most equitable and competitive condition for all. The priorities are to put a premium on shop making, squad equity, and uniformity from day to day. Correct. And truly that was what the lane maintenance team was trying to do every single week, even though you had a tremendous amount of challenges with different venues and surfaces and, you know, as we start talking about later on in the years, you know, different bowling balls and top coats and base coats on the lanes. Um, this also brings a couple articles out, you know, dressing of lanes often misunderstood, okay? Big misunderstood. Uh, that was by Bill Ryan, Sentinel Bowling Writer. Lane maintenance can be a tough job, you know, and, and one of the key factors that's going to lead us into some of this conversation was Lenny had wrote here, when urethane balls first came out, it drastically changed the care down of the oil, and with the new reactive resin balls, they have a greater porosity and are absorbing the oil. So we're getting less carry down and have to put out greater amounts of oil because of the resin balls. Well, you actually went through a lot of ball changes. I mean, in the 70s, what were they primarily throwing? Uh, in the 70s, they were just getting into plastic, but prior to that, it was all rubber. It was all rubber. It was rubber. Your Manhattan rubbers, your AMF three daughters, your Dick Weber five star. Uh, uh, many of them were just the regular rub and regular pancake plat box. It's, uh, they didn't hook, hook much, but. Uh, uh, that was the uh, uh, ball of choice. We had no other but those rubber bowling balls. Did so. you have a huge, was it, was it easier, try to remember back, was it easier to try to create this, you know, uniformity day to day and, and equity with rubber balls than it was plastic? Did when plastic come out, did all of a sudden that throw a whole nother, you know, uh, thing into the variable mix? Well, yeah, as, as the equipment evolves through the rubber, plastic, urethane, 92, where reactive resin started, every little phase we had to add a little bit more oil, and a little bit more oil, and a lot, a little bit more length. And why was that? It was and just the friction? The, the friction and the ability to keep that condition on the lanes. 
Uh, like I said, uh, rubber was not a problem because we are only using four or five mils of oil which lasted all day. Now when you got into the plastic balls, now we start oiling twice a day. Even in league, uh, league competition, uh, we start oiling in the afternoons uh, for our, uh, win our uh, fall leagues and our uh, uh, six and nine o'clock leagues. When we got into reactive resins, uh, once again, the oil volume went up to protect the lane surface because the balls were taking off the surface, creating early hook friction, and to some players, an unplayable condition. Gotcha, gotcha. Since we're talking about these different decades, um, and I know this is going to be tough because obviously you got a lot of really good relationships with uh, past and present professional players. I believe um, I do, yes. You know, but. I'm gonna, I want you to see if you can pull one out. Let's go 60s, 70s era maybe. You got a specific bowler in that era that really stuck out for you and, and why was that? Yeah. Well in the 60s, of course the 70s, uh, uh, the player I watched on uh, when we had the smaller bowling shows was Dick Hoover. Uh, Dick Hoover was nothing fancy or anything but he filled frames. He didn't miss spares, he got the strikes when he needed. And very rarely did you see him with an open unless it was a four, you know, four, six, seven, ten, or something where he just went for nine. The seventies, I gotta, I gotta go with Earl on that one. At, uh, him, the same thing. Uh, he, his eye-hand coordination was just uh, well above everybody at that point, and uh, he made good shots. And uh, a lot of people don't know uh, he had uh, as many seconds as he did firsts. Uh, which man, he was on TV a lot, and uh, and uh, uh, definitely uh, was on your uh, Saturday shows a lot. He was on TV when other very good left-handers were oh. involved and, and could not get even close. That's correct. correct. Was it true that he actually came out on tour one time and then went back home for a stint to practice and then came back out? That is correct. Uh, I was unfortunate, uh, actually, to bowl against Earl before anybody else knew him. <laughs> Uh, being from Seattle, Washington, uh, Earl was out of Tacoma, and uh, we had a traveling league every Tuesday night. And for you Seattle lights or your older guys, I'm sure you remember it. And Earl Ball with the Kentucky Fried Chicken team, and uh, uh, between tour and everything, uh, he would bowl that. But yes, Earl did come home uh, one time because uh, he wasn't performing to his expectations, and he came home and worked on his game and worked on it. And when he went out the second time, uh, it's in the history books. Lights out. Yeah. Just unbelievable. Go back to hard practice. You know? Yeah, it was practice. To be good, you have to practice. Let's ramp in the 80s, because 80s we had a ton of changes. I know we had your thing, but we also had water based finishes. Came, we're coming out differently for, for the wood lanes, things like that. What player for you stands out in that era? None other than Walter Ray. Walter Ray uh, was, uh, uh, was his eye co hand coordination, and he could play pretty much any part of the lane, and uh, once again, another player that never missed spares. Uh, anybody that can, you know, fill frames consistently through a, uh, especially a 48 game to a 56 game major format, uh, that holds volumes uh, to be a, as good a competitor as he is and perform at the high level in the 80s. And he, he literally, I mean, you know, as world class. Horseshoe champion. Right. His wife Paige, I think, also had some yeah, world titles. Did. Horseshoe uh, champion as well on the on the ladies' side of that. But yeah, his hand eye was incredible. And yeah. What, like you said, I mean, I've seen him play fifth arrow, and I've seen him go mm. pipe it right up one. Yeah, uh, that's why it was called dead eye. Dead I mean, perfect. Uh, exactly. Uh, uh, a little story with Walter. We did a, uh, a seminar over in Japan one year where. We stood up in front and talked to these kids, and one kid asked Walter, I noticed you're playing playing five uh, on this pattern. Can I ask you what happens if, if you miss five? And his answer was, I don't. <laughs> That's awesome. So, and you know what? And, and i got to tell you, we've been behind him a lot. Yeah, but he don't. Uh, yeah, he's just, he's just that, mm -hmm. that on. I mean, dead eye once again. 90s, I know this is a tough one. It's a tough one for me because there's a group, so I'd oh, let you pick a group of them if you want. Uh, the group, uh, i got to start with Mike Albee. Uh, uh, Mike, uh, uh, everybody thinks lefties can only play outside of 10. Uh, I've seen Mike uh, win inside of, uh, inside of fourth arrow. 
He's a very versatile player. Once again, he doesn't miss spares. He's got a great attitude towards bowling. Wonderful and, guy. He's and a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful person. And uh, he, uh, he, uh, he knows how to focus and uh, keep an even keel out on the lane. Mike Albee, excellent player without a doubt. And without, we have to throw uh, not just Mike. You had Norm Duke out there, great player, uh, Brian Voss, uh, Parker Bone. Uh, Pete Weber can't go without him. That's He's a problem. They were such a big There's group. There's so many him, of them. Him Guys, if I missed you, I apologize. Yeah, but I mean, in my ear, I was blessed with great, great players. I have to say, it was always kind of cool for me because you know, being a fan of a lot of these bowlers and and then getting out there and being able to be around them, and then now years later having personal relationships with some of them. I mean, it just it's it's a fan's dream. You know, even though we were on the the working end of that. Um, so, out of all the different ball changes that you had to deal with. What do you think, you personally, take equipment out of it, spray gun or whatever, what do you think would be the easiest technology of balls to, to condition with? Urethane. Urethane. Yes. I always felt like if, you know, urethane didn't do a whole lot of It was a nice smooth balance. arc, there's no jumping to it, uh, very predictable. Once again, uh, you got to go back to practice and... Uh, Hone your skills. It's all repetition and, and muscle memory. You got that down, and and uh, practice. Uh, it just opens up the whole lane, whether it's an easy house shot or a competitive tournament shot. Well, every single example you gave, I noticed you you inserted never miss spares. Never miss spares. Spares, yeah. spares are still lit. Rhino yeah. Page came on on one show and said the same thing, and and really. We know how important that is because we watched them teach that down the training center. But as lanes people, we obviously saw a lot of great players yes. not make it because, you know, they, they left some wood back on, on the table back Correct. Then. But, well, Steve, I can't thank you enough, brother. We're going to uh, try to crank up another episode with you and I real soon and dive a little bit more into some well, different yeah, parts of the past. Yeah, awful lot of information I would like to get out to the public of what they don't know. Absolutely. What they don't know, and they should know it. If, uh, they have a passion for the sport like we both do. And for any of you that has not gotten a copy of Lynn Nicholson's book, uh, The PBA Hall of Famers, we highly recommend it. This will also give you some insight into some of the historical things that Steve and I will hopefully continue to be able to bring to you in future shows. My brother? Yes. I'll catch you Thank tonight, you. Man. We'll do this again. All right, buddy. Thank See you. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a wrap. Keep those wrenches turning and have a wonderful day.